uh, I show my appreciation to the National Advisory Board of Impact Investors for bringing together such a high profile um, list of panelists as well as speakers. I'll be looking forward to my session that I'm moderating today, which is on how to boost uh, funding to early stage social enterprises. Uh, I can imagine there's uh, some SMEs in the audience, um, both here in pre here physically and also online, that are looking to hear or to get insights on how they can position themselves to get funding. Um, you can imagine that um, funding is obviously critical to any business, especially to those in the early stages. Um, also, I think we'd be, I'll probably have um, in so, some of our guests, possible investors who are looking for opportunities, and I would like to make a social impact. Uh, to introduce myself, my name is Austin Chijikwa. I'm the head of investment banking at uh, Zanako and also currently acting in the role of head business banking, uh, which takes care of our SME and agri customers. So for me, a personal career goal is to do my part in helping build um, a strong funding ecosystem that supports all businesses, all businesses at all stages. And I think particularly early stage businesses, which represent the bulk of SMEs in Zambia. Uh, and allow me to introduce very, very quickly um, my very high profile uh, list of panelists. I'm very excited to be, to have them here. Uh, my name is Simon Zamiangana. I work for Bongo Hive, uh, which is a digital innovation hub that has been around for at least 10 years now and uh, works with entrepreneurs, but also does uh, digital transformation consultancy with uh, corporations. Okay, my name is uh, Sam Sariri. Um, I'm an entrepreneur, uh, focused mostly in the healthcare sector. And um, yeah, so that's, that's the space that I play. Good afternoon, Elias Chipimon. I am co-founder of Mentor.me. We support access to credit by small and medium-sized enterprises, as well as capacity building for them. But I'm also co-founder of the Zambia Business Angels Network, which supports early stage enterprises. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Bita. I work with Goodall Investments, um, based out of Nairobi. Uh, Goodall Investments is a Pan-African investment um, private equity fund looking at investments across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa with uh, uh, stations in Kenya, where I sit, um, in Nigeria, Lagos, um, and in Cape Town, South Africa, looking at Southern Africa. Um, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. So I think maybe just to give some context on the constitution of our panel here, uh, we have a very interesting mix. So we have the value chain of financing here. So I'm the bank at the tail end, but Simunza here represents the incubators and accelerators. So just the beginning of uh, the funding or support for SMEs. Um, and then we also have Elias, who is also the uh, a co-founder of the Zambia Business Angel of Networks, Network Investor, Angel Investors, sorry. And that picks it up from the accelerator. We've got Bitter, who is also in venture capital that picks it up from, from, you know, from Elias. And then to kind of run it off, we actually have an SME that's actually going through some of these processes. So I'm looking forward to a very, very interesting discussion. And to kick us off, I would like to start off with Simonza. Let's start at the beginning of the value chain, right? So, Simon Zawa, for the past 10 years, um, you're at Bongo Hive, right? And you've been helping startups and SMEs grow their businesses. So, which includes connecting them to funding opportunities. In your experience, uh, I would like to know, what are some of the main barriers that Zambian startups and SMEs face when raising funding both locally and also internationally? And I'd like you to speak around possible solutions to some of those challenges. Thank you very much, Austin. All right. So if we talk about the journey, I think to understand what goes on and where the opportunities for growth happen within an enterprise, you understand, you have to understand the, the growth cycle for, for what we call a startup. And uh, when you, when you, when, again, when you talk about businesses, you also have to understand that no business, businesses are not necessarily made equal. So for example, a trade business would say, okay, great. What I do is I need stock, keep it in, then sell it off to the other side and create my revenue uh, in, in that cycle. Now, when we come to what we call tech startups, what you have there is that you have this uh, different form of um, enterprise that starts off with a group of people that have talent. So that's the first thing that you need to consider. Talent that use digital infrastructure to then build a product that they then take to market. Now, that's what's that's exciting that also uh, creates a challenge in the sense that they generally don't have the collateral that they can take the, to come to you at the bank and say hey hold my collateral 
I now need, I hold my collateral, let me borrow some money from you. And that's what I'll use to then build the business that I have. So the amount of, the amount of uh, funding typically required at the very early stages then is that they'll then most likely go for a different form of funding, which is sort of say, since we don't have collateral, we need to hire talent, we need to get infrastructure, we need to get into the market and, and whatever else that they're trying to solve at that point is, they'll then go and have a conversation about selling shares in their company and say, this is a dream we have, this is the opportunity we see in the market. If we solve for X and we're the first to market or whatever their position is within the market, you will become a percentage owner in this entity that will grow hopefully very quickly. And then you can have the conversation uh, around whether you're talking about scale or growth, you can go quickly towards that end. And that's the promise they're selling towards potential investors to then give them financing within that market. So now the, ch the challenges that you have that they then face uh, within that is that at the very end stage, at idea stage is somebody to actually believe in what they're trying to do. The next thing is how do they actually build what they're trying to do? So where do they get the talent? Where do they get the infrastructure with these computers, access to internet, a place to work from, and, uh, and the knowledge that they need to actually, to actually get, uh, to get that done. Then if it's in a regulated space like finance, it's making sure they can get the licenses uh, and they can get everything. And, and, and none of that comes, none of that comes uh, very, very cheaply. So what we tend to find is that understanding, first of all, the build that they need to go so that they can actually have a product that they can show an early stage investor, or uh, if you're talking to Elias as an angel investor, to be, you at least want them to be able to say to him, look, we are capable of building this. This is what we've done so far. His team of angels can then say, we believe what you're doing. We believe what you're saying. We have an understanding of the market that you're getting into and that will get into them. As they then start to grow based on that, it's, it's the typical thing of now, how do they administer their company? How do they get the financials right? Can they do reporting that satisfies the angels and says, this is what we've done with your money. This is how we've grown to this state. And these are the things we need to put in place. So that by the time they're now talking to Beta and then going on to Basel at PE level, all of these, all of these structures are all in place. So you'll find that the full chain, before they can come to a bank, is can we finance them at idea, at, just after they've produced a product to them then being able to get to the market and then them fulfilling milestones of growth that convince uh, potential investors and the advice that they can get to be able to, to then be fit for, for investment. No, yeah. thank you, Simunza. So I guess at this stage, we're saying the SME is basically in exchange for, you know, a, the dream. They're giving you a share and the potential to become something big yeah right so obviously that creates a challenge in the sense that maybe not everyone buys into the dream so what are some of the solutions um you know to help them access financing or funding and i'm going to after you i'd like to pick it up with elias who picks it up the sme from your space so for that sme at early stage what are some of the solutions in terms of making them i guess investor ready so, so what we do um, when we see a startup is we work at three different phases. So the first phase is what we call ideation, which is we listen to the idea and then help them, uh, and help them figure out what the business model is for this idea that they have. So they might come to us and say, hey, we want to solve for, we want to use technology to solve for people being able to buy watermelons across the country. I'm just giving an example. Not that it's not possible, but just giving an example for that. And then we are like, okay, great. What's the market opportunity? Can this be done? Where are you going to source the watermelons from? If people are ordering online, how quickly can they get watermelons? Like we help them to, to navigate that. What do you need to be able to do? What do you need to have in place? Do you need warehouses to store these watermelons? Are you crushing those watermelons? How are you selling these watermelons? Do you need trucks to deliver those watermelons? Once they have the general idea of that, that gives them a picture of how much they need to get started. It and it gives them a, a starting point to say, okay, great, this is where we're starting and this is where we're going to build ourselves to. So our next level is what we call the go-to-market phase where we now say, okay, great, they've built a product, they've built a prototype, can they start testing it in the market? Now, the two places they can be, they can be in a regulated industry where we now have to go and get permission to go and then say, okay, great, this is a new idea, it's working within here, can you give them permission to operate? So for example, the Securities Exchange Commission and the Bank of Zambia this year launched uh, sandboxes that allow for experimentation of prototypes yeah. uh, in the market, in regulated areas and allow them to operate for at least two years uh, to at least seek market and test that that's something that can actually, 
and the market always wins so the market will either reject the idea or accept the idea and if it's accepted then we've got some cycle of growth that then that then allows them us to then take them towards investor readiness and have the conversation that then appeals to an angel that then says hi based on this traction based on proof that customers are interested in this product and that it's actually working here's your opportunity for growth so let's pick it up from there. So Elias, I'd like to pick it up with, with you from there, right? So uh, the business uh, angel network, right? was launched in September just mm -hmm. uh, this year. And the objective that uh, the ZBAN has is, the, is filling the financing gap uh, of for young businesses, right? I think that speaks to where Simons has kind of left off. So now at this point, there's a viable business model, perhaps there's a viable product, right? So how is ZBAN at this point um, addressing some of the challenges that um, in the Zambian ecosystem regarding raising financing for small businesses. And maybe perhaps to get a sense, or so if anyone is a small business that's kind of at that stage, what are some of the, what are some of the types of investment businesses you're looking to invest in? So Simunza has described the ideal process, um, but not everybody gets into an incubator, uh, but it's extremely helpful. Uh, to have the incubator process uh, accessible to as many startups and early stage enterprises as possible because they deal with a lot of the kind of challenges that an angel investor would then otherwise have to be dealing with. And they've got limited capacity and limited bandwidth in terms of you know, how much capital that they, they can actually put in and how much time they can commit. Um, so it, it's an ideal process. The, the reality, however, is that the bulk of people that will turn up looking for angel investors are far more than any of the incubators can accommodate. Um, the good thing is that there are new incubators coming up, um, and, and so that, that part of the enabler environment is, is growing and, and being strengthened. So typically what an angel investor has to do is really roll up their sleeves and do a lot of the work that the incubators would be doing. Um, so getting them sometimes just to develop their ideas a little bit better. Uh, the focus will really be around, and it depends on what angel um, up is approached. Uh, so typically, you, you've had angel investment taking place in Zambia and in many countries for many years. All that we've done is we've brought a group of angels together um, in order to have a, a shared approach to how we, we manage this uh, opportunity that's there with uh, young enterprises wanted, wanting resources. Um, so invariably, we're bringing some capital, but what's more important is actually um, helping the entrepreneurs think through how to structure their businesses, um, bringing the connections that they might need, uh, bringing some strategic advice and guidance. Uh, and it, it's sometimes quite a difficult process because the entrepreneurs come in with very strong views about what they think uh, their business requires in order for it to succeed. And so invariably, we have to be the ones that burst their bubble uh, and in order to help to sh shape their idea into something that's much more viable as a proposition for investment. Um, but it, it's important to caution that it is very high risk. So we're committing capital and we're committing other resources to ensure that this business might succeed. But the rule of thumb is that you're going to probably have nine out of 10 failures, but the one that will Will succeed will more than compensate for the challenges that you'll have experienced in the in the other nine. No, thanks, Lars. I think that's actually very that's a very good answer, and I think it builds into nicely into Bitter. If you can hear me online, so Bitter, you're with uh, Goodwill Investments, uh, based out of uh, Kenya, right? And, yeah. and so I'd like to get a now at this point expand the landscape. So I would like to hear from you. So you have invested in a company in Zambia. Um, as well as in several other African countries. So I'd like to hear from you, what factors attract an investor such as yourself to an entrepreneur ecosystem? Assuming, like Elias said, like, you know, the dream case has happened where they've gone through the incubator and have been also been nurtured by a good business angel uh, investor. I think, first of all, there's, uh, there's, there's, there's this idea that an attractive market is, is a large market, right? Um, but of course, there are many things that make a market attractive uh, for, for, for venture investment. And one is that, you know, technology can make a difference. Um, so that is one thing that we really look at, you know, when, when we're looking at, at, at an ecosystem. I mean, how can we use technology to, to sort of make a difference in, in the various uh, value chains um, or sectors that we sort of invest in? 
Um, and I think also one of the things that we also look at really is, is uh, you know, industries that are structurally high margin. Um, and, and when I talk about that, what I'm saying is that, you know, you want to look at an ecosystem where, you know, the consumer um, has kind of been uh, prevented from accessing certain goods and services. And so if you're actually able to, to provide uh, that streamlined access to certain goods or services, um, then one of you're talking about high margins because you're moving more downstream. Uh, but second of all, you know, you, you're trying to provide access to a wider market. Um, and that is something that is also very, very attractive um, to us. Um, another thing also is, is still in, in, in the concept of, 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 of um, industry and, and high margin. Also, we look at an ecosystem where we can actually be able to have an application of businesses where there isn't a lot of CapEx involved. Right. Um, because, you know, if you're coming, you know, you're having small companies coming up, they don't have a lot of capital. Um, they're trying to scale their businesses. They're trying to provide, you know, goods and services. Um, but, you know, they don't have the amount of capital um, that would need them in a capex heavy sort of uh, industry and business. And so that is something that you also look at um, um, when you're looking at an ecosystem to invest in and also, of course, uh, the sectors or industries to to invest in no thanks for the, thanks for that beta so we've kind of gotten a sense of now the how the value chain kind of works right but let's also get let's let's temper uh, and get a realistic uh, experience from uh, an actual sme um uh, sam i know you're in the process of um uh, fundraising for your business so please walk us through your fundraising journey how has it been so far uh, what is working? Uh, what is working for you uh, based on our ecosystem? And what doesn't seem to working as well uh, as you engage both local and foreign investors? All right, thanks. Um, so, I mean, uh, very pertinent observations, I think, from uh, the panelists. Uh, so, I mean, to speak really about uh, fundraising, um, I remember having a conversation with um, an investor who said fundraising is a line and not a dot. So whether you're actively fundraising or passively fundraising, I think it's something that you constantly need to sort of be doing uh, because inevitably it's about relationships and uh, track record that you build over a period of time. So if I get to know Bita or, or Elias, um, uh, maybe over a period of six months, slowly build up a case. Hi Elias, I started from 10, I'm now 20, now I'm at 50. Is sort of able to see that trajectory and that track record. So I think for me personally, it's, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's always a conversation uh, that's been had a relationship that's been built. So that's my view on fundraising. So, uh, and I think that's helpful because I think uh, most of these things are spillover effect of, of good relationships and, uh, and obviously traction. Then, I mean, speaking from, um, uh, 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 an experienced point of view. So, I mean, when we, when I first started, uh, sort of, uh, in my entrepreneurship journey, I was, I was a junior doctor, um, at UTH, very passionate about, uh, helping people impact and a lot of, um, you know, uh, very impact driven sort of, um, uh, offerings, uh, with two of us, uh, two young doctors. And, uh, we were so passionate about what we're doing. Uh, we focus more on the social, uh, we forgot about the enterprise. So I think for us, one of the biggest challenge was realizing, even as we talk about impact investment, vis-a-vis uh, -vis looking at sort of it from an impact perspective, is to really realize that you're still running an enterprise. So whether or not it's called impact or not impact, at the end of the day, fundamentally, it's still an enterprise. It needs to make money. It needs to provide an offering that people in the market value and are willing to pay for. Uh, then in terms of, I mean, just the challenges, um, I think Bita uh, did uh, uh, allude to, to something around uh, the size of the market. So if you look at Africa, all the big funding goes to Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya. Um, and um, I, think, I, I think Egypt is, uh, is coming up now. So you sort of have like the big four in Africa uh, that are drawing a lot of the funding. And uh, when you do talk to some of the investors, I mean, Zambia is sort of like, when you look at it from the market perspective, uh, very, very insignificant. 
So I think that's been, uh, I mean, I know for a lot of um, uh, my colleagues that are actively uh, uh, fundraising, that's, that's probably been one of the issues. Um, the other issue I think is around just um, uh, uh, local sort of uh, angel investors. So I'm happy that Elias has, has launched the, the Business uh, Angels Network. Uh, I mean, it's, I think it's a great uh, initiative. Uh, but I think for a long time in Zambia, um, the concept of angel investment is very, very strange. And if you look at what uh, angel investors, uh, or if you're an investee, if you look at what you're competing with, you're competing with treasury bills, government bonds. If I'm an investor, I've got a hundred thousand kwacha or a million kwacha. If I put it in treasury bill, or at least maybe two years ago, 18 months or so, I was getting a return of uh, somewhere in the high 20s. So then I have to take that money and then possibly risk it in this very passionate young person. Um, you know, the, 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 that, that trade-off, I think, um, uh, from my uh, observation, is, um, is, is a bit difficult. So you're obviously competing with very stable, high-return uh, instruments on the local market. And then for the international market, you're looking at investors that are very focused on the, on the big, uh, big market on the big market. So I think that would uh, uh, probably sum up uh, some of the challenges that are, that are obtaining. Yeah, a lot of really interesting things that uh, Sam raised, you know, a line and not a dot, um, the idea about fundraising uh, and then being investor ready. So if you look at the story of the individuals that have managed to raise significant sums of capital from foreign markets, so whether you look at Flutterwave um, or, or any of the, the, the really big um, investments that have happened across Africa, the story is similar. This has been maybe a five, six year journey of continual pitching, continuously getting it wrong, learning the hard way, making the mistakes. Um, and it's just repetition, uh, reinforcement, uh, learning from the mistakes and improving at each stage. So it's, it's not an overnight success. Um, so I, I think that that's a really important point. Secondly, I think when entrepreneurs think about growing their businesses or even starting their businesses, the belief invariably centers around, I need money. Now, if your business is not structured right, it doesn't matter how much money you're given, it's going to fail. And there's a value that comes in non-monetary form. Sometimes it can be opening up an opportunity, a market opportunity that enhances the value of your proposition significantly. And that's a form of investment. It doesn't always have to be cash. In, in fact, what you tend to find is the best types of investments uh, help to build the value of the company, not through a cash injection, but through non-cash means. And it's usually that hybrid that uh, or should I say, it's usually that initial uh, support that unlocks the opportunity for additional capital to be raised. So the angels come in, in in two ways, you know, both in terms of bringing in some capital, but invariably they're going to be very cautious about what they're going to spend their money on. And if there's a way in which they can bring their expertise, contacts, connections, and market opportunities, they will do that. And what you tend to find is that with the angels, because they want to invest in an enterprise that's connected to their own area of expertise, there'll usually be some way that they can align businesses they're already operating in with what this startup is trying to do. And so they bring in a vital connection that can pull up uh, the opportunity for growth uh, for this uh, entrepreneur. And typically, when you're looking at being investor ready, um, Simonza probably has a much better uh, profile for you know what the investors are looking for but it depends on who the investor is but invariably there's some fundamental things um what's the quality of the management you know this is usually a, a, a huge challenge because you're investing in the individual you're not really investing in the system as such or what it is that you know their proposition is but really it's the individual uh, and the team that's around them and invariably they're going to have challenges around management they're going to have challenges around governance uh, and there's a distinction between the two. Um, you know, with governance, you're really just looking at, you know, what systems and processes do you have rather than what skills do you uh, individually have and uh, able to work as a team. There's information. 
Um, what's the quality of the information? There's usually so much information asymmetry when it comes to uh, startups and early stage enterprises. There's also a lack of focus and responsiveness. Um, we find that with a lot of the enterprises that are approaching us as business angels, we're keen to invest in them. We're keen to pursue things, but they're just not responsive invariably because they're chasing money elsewhere. This may even just be a side hustle. So if you look at Zambia, for example, one of the reasons that it's difficult to bring capital into uh, these enterprises is because they look at the market. Now, if you just look at Zambia as a market, it's not going to be attractive. But if you look at Zambia sitting in the middle of 350 million people within the SADC region, suddenly the prospects change. And that's why aligning with the government policy positions and trade starts to make sense for even the smallest enterprise. No, thanks, Lars. So clearly, I think in just investor angels, I think, will play a very critical role in growing early stage businesses. Um, you don't have to answer this question, but I'll just kind of park it. So do we have enough, you know, angel investors? But I'll be, I would like to move on to Simonza and kind of the same question around investor readiness. I think Elias mentioned that you might have, a, you know, some more um, to contribute on, on that question. I'm not sure if Bita is online. I'm also kind of like to pick it up with him in terms practically then what does it take to land an investor? But I'd like to hear your comments as well on being investor ready. All right. So there are a number of things. You first have to define the type of enterprise that you're investing in before you then try to check the, the type of enterprise and the type of stage and the stage that you're investing in before you can then check off the list of what investor readiness uh, looks like. So, uh, so what I was trying to say at the very beginning is that the when you talk about the typical SME and you talk about what we call a startup, we look at them as very different vehicles. So the SME being a business with a business model that already exists is known. So people are willing to take risk at it because they know X is opening a shop. We know how many clothes you can sell. We know how shops operate. And there's a plan there that we can, that we, that we can work around. When you now start to get into what we call high growth, high risk uh, uh, ventures, we're looking at initially experiments for someone trying to find a solution to a problem that exists within the market. Yeah. And this is what you would call market creating innovation. So it's somebody working on an innovative idea for something that possibly doesn't exist in the market. So when you talk about the flutter waves and you talk about the, and the thing, it's that they're, they're laying down infrastructure for financial, for financial systems that didn't exist on the continent. Yeah. So payment gateways and so forth and so on that, 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 that didn't exist. So somebody sees an opportunity and then builds for that. So the first person that typically takes a risk on that is, as Elias has said, is it's going to come around to, do I know you? What do you know? So Austin, you've come to me, you've come with an idea. Do I know you? What do you know? Why should I trust you with my money? Yeah. So, and, 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 and hence the term when people talk about family, friends, and fools, taking the first bet on an entrepreneur by saying, okay, great, we'll, we can all do 10,000 kwacha each or 20,000 kwacha each to get in your company yeah. because we know you've got banking experience which, and we know that you, you can work well with, with techies. Recording we, know that you can actually ship, we know that you can actually ship a product. Yeah. When he proves, when that entrepreneur then proves that they've got an experience in being able to do that, that they can actually ship a project, they can actually take it into market, then the next level, when you now start talking to angels, they'll ask for more things now. They'll be like, okay, great. How many customers have shown interest in this product? Yeah. So that's where now your, your growth, your ability to acquire customers, your skill in actually uh, convincing customers that this is a solution that actually works for them, uh, getting into the market then starts to, matter, starts to matter. So investor readiness at the angel level will then, be, will the, will then start to differ. It's like, oh, great. Do you have customers that actually agree that this is something that actually works? Yeah. Do you have, uh, do you, are you actually registered as a company? Uh, have you actually f started to get a bank account and put these things in? So the first people that took risk, took risk on the idea, at the next stage they're now looking at formalization and still working with the entrepreneur, but then trying to say, okay, great, what's your next goal? My next goal is I need to get to 100 customers, but I also need to get a license. I need to get the following things. So they will say, okay, great. We've got a great lawyer on the team. We've got a great lawyer who's an angel who can give you advice. We've got, uh, I've got connections to be able to introduce you to, to certain people. And I've got a great sales guy who will help you build a sales team that will help you get the next set of customers that you can get. That's the value of a set of angels being able to work around uh, a company and being able to now put in more skill and help them build a team that then can then take that product later on into market. 
By the time you start going to Bitter, Bitter now has got another list as an investor that then says, you've been in the market for a bit. I need to know whether you've got your books in order. I need to know whether you're audited. I need to know whether you've got this and that and so forth. So he's got now a whole different list of things which qualifies for his set, uh, for his set uh, when it comes to uh, investor readiness. No, yeah. thanks, Monza. So what I'm getting from you and what I'm getting from Elias is investor ready will vary from stage to stage. Yeah. In the beginning, you're an idea, so you have to show that you as the person driving the business are bankable. Yeah. Can we trust you? Do you know what you're doing? Have you found the solution, the right solution for the problem? After that, next thing is you're saying, um, Elias, okay, look, look, like, okay, we, we understand that, but now is this product selling? Um, and then building on, and I'd like Bita to actually join in here. So let's make this practical um, and then try to bring it back. So the question I would, I would like you to kind of respond and build off from that, but I'd like also for you to um, give some insights, right? So it's one thing for an entrepreneur to land a first meeting with an investor, uh, but it's another thing to actually close a fundraising deal. So I'd like to hear from you, Bita, if you're there. How does an entrepreneur get to a place of closing a deal with an investor? Uh, what are some of the strategies, right, that uh, Zambian entrepreneurs should be aware of? Is there any, like, you know, like tips or tricks, uh, if you can call them that? And what are some of the mistakes to avoid? I think uh, very, very interesting insights from, from Simunza there. Um, because for us, I mean, one of the things that, you know, we, we, we look at, and, and most VCs also look at, is, you know, once you've now moved past the idea stage, right, and now you, you want to scale and grow and you're looking for a kind of capital, I think one of the things that we look at is, are you able to sort of build a team around yourself? And so at this particular point in time, it becomes less of you and more of the team that you can actually be able to build around yourself, right? Um, because the question that we ask ourselves is, in the event that this company, which is, you know, founder-led, um, the founder is not there, can this company be able to to stay for the period of our investment. We typically invest, you know, seven to 10 years, right? Uh, so what you're saying is that, is this person able to build a team around them that can actually be able to uh, drive the company going forward? Um, the second thing now becomes also the question of governance, right? Um, we want to understand also that, you know, the, the, the company can be able to have a proper board in place, uh, to have proper governance structures in place. Uh, people can, who can actually be able to, or rather the, the management team can be able to be answerable to um, and be able to help the company now um, think through their growth strategy, you know, which markets are we going to get into, which verticals are we going to um, to attack, um, how are we going to access or approach this, these kinds of markets. Um, and then that also, as a second aspect, becomes very, very critical for us. The third thing that we, we are critical about um, that also draws us closer to uh, closing an investment with, with an investee is also thinking around growth uh, going forward. Um, we've now, you know, moved past the product market fit. Uh, and what we are saying now, we want to scale further, uh, whether it's within, you know, the country of operations or whether it's within uh, across regions. And what we want to understand is that having gotten the product market fit, um, is a company able to replicate uh, that uh, 10 times over or 20 times over? Are they able to do this again and again and again? You know, do they have perhaps a sales team in, in place that can be able to, to get contracts? Um, do they have technology in place that can be able to scale? Um, at this point in time, maybe they're dealing with 10,000 customers. What happens if, you know, can their technology be able to handle a million customers or 2 million customers? Um, and so we also look at growth in terms of both how you've built your team and how you've built your infrastructure because most of the companies that we invest in have uh, sort of like um, an inclination towards technology um, the technology aspects then becomes uh, very very important for us to to see and i think thirdly we look at the macros and, and that is broadly right uh, so we try to ask ourselves um what are the potential risks to growth you know um are we understanding the competition well enough? Uh, is it well articulated by the entrepreneur? Does he have a good understanding of the market in which uh, he or she operates in? Um, does he understand the risks or the regulations that, for example, in fintech or in, in clean energy um, that could potentially be able to affect his business going forward? Has he structured his business in a way that can be able to um, to counter some of the risks that we that we sort of see? Um, and, and, and that forms a big part of what you typically call our commercial due diligence, just trying to understand from the entrepreneur and how the business is structured, whether that business is actually positioned um, and to, to scale. And, and that forms a very big part of our decision-making process. Um, and so for an entrepreneur to be able to close a transaction with us, I think they need to really 
demonstrate that they have a good understanding uh, of the key pillars uh, of the business. And maybe if you, I should just summarize them, I should say, you know, the team, um, the problem that he's trying to solve and the opportunity that exists in the market, is it a niche problem? Um, is it a big market? Um, because for, for venture capitalists like us, I mean, the size of the market is very, very critical for us. Um, and not only, I had some talking about it, um, you can build a solution in Zambia that actually can have an effect across Africa. So, so just being in Zambia for some should, should not be um, an impediment for you building solutions that can actually scale across uh, beyond Zambia. Uh, and so also understanding the problems, um, you know, that exist in the market that they're operating and how big those problems or rather their solutions can actually be able to, to solve those big problems. Uh, understanding competition, understanding the risks that are, that are um, in the market. And some of these things we're actually able to get uh, through our commercial due diligence and in conversations with entrepreneurs and of course leveraging on the fact that we've invested in uh, most sectors so we're able to actually borrow from the various business models that um, um, have come through uh, whether the ones that we've invested in or some business models that we actually just see um, in the ecosystem uh, in general so i think in summary a good understanding uh, of the solution that, um, that the entrepreneur uh, is bringing to the existing problem is 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 one thing that is really really critical uh, for us to close uh, a particular transaction with, with an entrepreneur. No, thank you, Peter. So I'd like to come back to Sam, right? So I'd like to hear from an entrepreneur's perspective. So we've seen the list of hurdles and hoops that you have to jump through. So I'd like to get from your experience. I mean, um, obviously, I think you have met Elias, you've met Munza, but I'd like for you to describe your process in terms of actually finding an incubator program um if you've had any uh you know any discussions with potential angel investors um and also perhaps vcs like beta like what has been your experience in terms of meeting some of those uh requirements and your own journey on being investor ready for each, each different type of investor that you've actually had discussions with Okay, all right. Um, so uh, there's something that Simuza mentioned, and it's something we always debate about <laughs> SME versus startups. Um, and 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 it's a segue to my uh, sort of like my first thought is um, I think you have to be very realistic about the markets that we operate in. Um, I think uh, entrepreneurs um, in Africa sort of have a dual sort of um, how can I put it? It's an opportunity, but it's a problem sometimes. When you read a lot of tech crunch and you see a lot of sort of high growth tech startups in Europe, in America, um, you have to be very um, realistic about the market here. Uh, and, and, and hence my point on, I think it's very important to be cash flow positive um, so that you are not relying on an investor per se for you to, to see tomorrow. So I remember some time back, I participated in, a, in an acceler uh, accelerator program in Europe. I think this was 2016. And you know, the way the European market is, especially for the tech startups, is um, at least from my experience, what I saw was for a lot of them that didn't raise money, they ended up closing. And the reason was we've closed because we haven't raised money. And I, I found that to be a bit weird because when you come to African markets, I mean, Raising money, sort of the uh, not raising money is the default. Yeah. So whichever way you have to be able to survive without uh, essentially uh, uh, raising money. So I think my first point is, I mean, just be very market realistic, get your hands dirty, do, I mean, whatever you need to do to make sure that you're cash flow positive, you're actually making money. And then you can sort of begin to evolve and then see what uh, sort of other um, uh, verticals you can tap into. The second thing I think is you also have to be very cognizant. I mean, you, you, you have to treat other people's money with a certain uh, sanctity. Uh, for, for a lot of investors, they are raising money from pension funds, you know, so these are pensioners, money, teachers, policemen, and they're contributing money and eventually it ends up in the hands of VCs. And I think you have to approach it with a certain uh, level of uh, respect and say, um, do I think, I'm at the point where I need to commit someone's hard-earned money into my enterprise. Um, so I think for me, those are the two points that I'll probably uh, contribute. Is one, I think just be 
very realistic about the market conditions and get started and make money as soon as you can. And don't rely on you needing to raise money from an investor. I think the conversation with an investor should be a plus, okay. not, not a do or die. Like if we don't get money next week, we're closing. I think that's a very bad, uh, very bad position to be in. And then the second thing is, um, I, uh, from experience, I think it's very important to, uh, to, to approach it with, with, you know, a certain level of respect for other people's money, because I mean, it's hard earned money. So you need to make sure that when you do ask people for money, it's, it's money that you put to good use, uh, and you have a good chance of being able to, uh, get them a return on investment. No, thanks. Uh, thanks, Sam. I think that's, those are some very interesting points. And I'd like to also kind of uh, allow Elias to kind of build off on that. There's some two things that he mentioned. Uh, so, of course, I think he's described the engagements that he's had with investors. Elias, I'd like for you to touch on um, the process, like that kind of two-way like two two way street uh, dynamic between the investor and um and the investee, like in this case. And then also he had mentioned something around being a part of an incubator program in the UK. Uh, Ismunz, I'll come back to you on this one. I would like to hear your views about having, um, you know, foreign participants in your business and how that potentially makes your business attractive for funding. But I'll start, I'll start with the liars first, right? So uh, we've been talking about ent what entrepreneurs need to do to attract funding, right? Uh, but let's also take it from their perspective, right? So we know that the fundraising journey should be a dating game, right? And so what do entrepreneurs need to do as due diligence on the investor, right? So that they're actually picking the right investor to work with. I was just going to share a, a, a story about an engagement that I had with um, one particular entrepreneur that turns up and um you know they they talked and talked and talked and talked and i had something like five questions that i you know needed answers to and they never answered a single one but they were in my office for over an hour and a half and um i i realized at that point that i needed to be perhaps a little bit more clear about my boundaries um and so by the time we we, we finished the conversation um you know i i made it clear that you know if they weren't going to answer the questions that the potential investors were asking and were only interested in telling their story which is a very common thing i mean you asked you know what can go wrong um this is an example of a dating uh, gone wrong um so the entrepreneur will come in they love their idea they think that it's the best thing uh, and they're convinced that this is how they need to sell it uh, so one critical thing is just to listen because the investor has some very specific questions that they want answered. Uh, there are certain things that they want to know. Um, they certainly want an entrepreneur that has passion, but in order to understand whether there's a commercially viable prospect of what they're trying to pursue, uh, those questions have to be answered. And invariably, the uh, entrepreneurs come in without having thought that through. So you can have a great idea, but it may have no commercial viability. And so when you're at that early stage, you know, Simonza mentioned that, you know, you have, because your first funders are going to be your friends, your family, and fools. Fools, of course, being the angel investors, because they come in to rescue your idea and, you know, the prospects of, of your business succeeding. And it's so important just to listen. What is it that the investor is wanting to know? How can I convert this idea into something that is commercially viable? Because you're looking looking for investment and so that investment has to have uh, a return so i think that's one of the most critical things i see uh, secondly and i just want to reiterate this point um you know if somebody tells you money doesn't matter um they'll lie to you about other things so we know money is important but when they front end the money talk then you 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 are always a little bit uh, uh, cautious and uh, look every investor knows that you're looking for money but they really want to understand how are you going to apply that money. So one of the things that uh, an entrepreneur can do that will help them in, their, in the dating process is to be able to articulate very clearly how the funds that they're looking for are going to be applied. And they're just some simple little steps and they don't require too much uh, talk, um, but they, they need to address the specific areas of concern uh, of the investor. 
And so, it, so entrepreneurs will do well just to listen and to be very specific in how they respond to what they perceive to be the needs of the investor. So thanks, Elias. Maybe just under a minute, just, I'd like to hear from, so for, from their perspective, who, who is the right to invest in the business? How do they make that decision? From the perspective of the... Of, the, of Sam's perspective, in this case. His yes, estimate. okay, that, that's a good point. I mean, invariably, especially when you're looking at angels, um, you see the value of an angel is less in the money that they bring than in the strategic insights that they can provide for the growth of your idea and the success of your potential enterprise. Um, and they bring the, the connections, but they also bring an expertise. So invariably, and this is the beauty of having an angel network, as opposed to just going to a single angel, is that when you're pitching, there's likely to be somebody that has some expertise in the specific area um, that your business is focused on. And they will bring that experience uh, to, to bear. And so you want to try and do a little bit of background. I mean, those that have watched, you know, these um, pitching sessions uh, like Dragon's Den and otherwise, you know, you see that the successful uh, entrepreneurs come in knowing which investor they are targeting and yeah. why they're targeting that uh, specific investor. So it's really important to do that background uh, work and check on the angels to know that, you know, you're pitching specifically to this angel for this particular reason. Um, I don't know if, you see, there hasn't been enough uh, of an education process around uh, angel investing in Zambia. We are the first uh, business angels network in the country. Um, so it, it's early days, but I think as you know, things develop, I know that Zanaco is running a program. Um, you, you run a Facebook program um, and, and you're looking at, you know, pitching. The, these are all things that slowly but surely will now become more culturally acceptable. And as people learn from the mistakes of others, they will improve in how they target uh, the angels that they want to invest in their businesses. Well, thanks, Adas, for recognizing our contributions on Quezo. And uh, Simunza, I know you've been itching to give a response. So Sam was an accelerator in the UK. So my question to you, right? So is it necessary uh, or what are the advantages or are there any benefits or having, um, you know, an expatriate on your team or in your business in terms of fundraising? So um, somebody once said to me, uh, and it's a very simple phrase, but uh, I think it, it holds true for the conversations we're having here, is money goes where it feels safe. And the, the conversation we're all having here about investor readiness, uh, what stage is the company at, so on and so on, and, and at every level that we're talking about is how safe is the entrepreneur, how safe is the entity that has been built uh for investment to take place and for what it, what the promise is, the promise made to be realized to, through that and how is that being communicated so if we if we follow the process that we've gone through it's if we start off with ideally in the ideal situation friends and family these are people that know you and trust you and then can bet money on you being able to do that they're likely to be the people that then provide the link to when the angel investor comes back and says, and when Elias comes back to me and says, hey, Funza, do you know, we know that you've invested in this company. What's the character of this person that, that, that what's the character of this person that we're, that, that, that we're dealing with? And based on that, when we go back to angels, they feel safer because it says, great, we've had a conversation. And so that's part of the role that we play as incubators is, as well, is being able to work with entrepreneurs, get to know the person that we're dealing with. And we, we get phone calls all the time. Hey, I've had this, I've had this founder come to me and have a conversation with me. They're raising money. What do you know about this entrepreneur? And we're able to say, okay, great. They're great at this. They need help with this. If you were to invest in them, encourage them to employ these people into their team because then that will cover their, that will cover their blind side. So now, the, now when it comes to this, this, this conversation around foreign, uh, foreign, uh, uh, foreign co-founders and foreign partners in the business, it comes back again to the question around trust. Uh, and before it goes off on the wrong side, this is not to say Africans are untrusted. It's just a question of when we go and start pitching ourselves to the Western world, they don't know us. We're, we're not coming from a community where we've engaged with them. We're, not, we're meeting them for the first time. Uh, and you'll find that even when you talk about African founders that have succeeded in, 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 in getting into YC or investing, the large majority of them have been to Stanford, have been to Harvard, 
so it's Nigerians who've been to Stanford, Nigerians who've been to Harvard and Kenya, and, and similarly. So you find that their ability to then engage investors in San Francisco, uh, Boston, and other areas like that, then becomes higher because they're they're talking to a network of people that they they're talking to a network of people that they know, and they're being introduced by people that they know because they've been at a university for four years, five years, and have, have and have got uh, that there. So when the, my, when the Bill and the Melinda Gates Foundation and uh, Village Capital this study, or uh, that then proved that the majority of raises that were happening within fintech. Uh, this was about four years ago that were happening within fintech and other tech areas within africa and it proved that the majority of those raises were actually being done by uh americans and europeans that had locked, relocated to, that had uh, located to africa and they were they were they were they were then building it they also included in there the fact that the, a lot of this was relational that they had the ability to back to their countries and because of the because of this common uh, being able to speak a common language, being able to speak come from a common community, they were able to raise a lot faster than if Simonza comes straight from Lusaka, finds himself in America, attends a pitch session, and everybody's like, "Okay, so who do I know that knows you that I can then check and say if I if I write a five hundred thousand dollar check to to Simonza uh, that year that year?" So so yes. There is value if you're trying to broaden your community in the way you're going to raise, but you're still going to have to address alignment between you and a co-founder that you're going to bring into your team, just like any other, just like any other time that you're finding a business partner to join your team. No, thanks, Monza. So we're almost coming to the end of our session. So, Bita, I would like to come back to you um, with two questions. Uh, one is wrapping up question, which I'd like to tackle. But the first one, before we do, I think is kind of building off on the conversation around opportunities, right? So, for any SMEs um, that are looking to be in a space where there's funding. Um, I would like from your kind of Pan-African, um, you know, perspective, what are, when, what are the trends across Africa, right? And in what, are, what trends are dominating the investment landscape? We've seen a bit of, we've seen a focus on, uh, on, on VCs in terms of financial technology, logistics startups, uh, and also there seems to be a preference for, you know, for tech, for tech based businesses. Uh, what's your perspective on this and are there opportunities in other sectors for SMEs to focus on? So just very, very quickly, I would like to get your, your thoughts there. So for any SMEs that are trying to position themselves in areas where there is likely to be support for their business. Yeah, I, th I think uh, I'm seeing may maybe largely two trends, right? Um, and one is sort of like large consumer markets uh, that I'm currently, I would say, maybe seem not to be making sort of like economic sense. Uh, for most investors. So you, when you think about education or some segments of, of fintech or healthcare, um, <clears throat> but these, are, these are segments where you don't have a lot of uh, companies. Uh, and because um, you know a lot of demand in these particular sectors are largely low income, right? So I see a lot of opportunities in these particular sectors because with the use of technology, um, you can help to build sort of like lower structures of entry uh, and make this part of these segments are uh, profitable. So I'm seeing more business models in the healthcare space, in the education space, in some aspects of, 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 of FinTech, uh, because when people talk about FinTech, um, the successes that you've actually seen are mostly on the transaction side. Uh, but if you look at the whole value chain of FinTech, you still have lending and you have savings and you have many other vert main verticals of, of FinTech that haven't been explored um, because they still sort of don't make economic sense for investors and haven't been explored. But with the advancement in technology, we are seeing more and more business models serving that large consumer market um, uh, that in Africa is largely low income. Um, and we are seeing technology intervening in that sense and making them more viable uh, and more profitable and attractive uh, for investors sort of to, to, to invest. And maybe to close it up, I'd like to, this question now is for all the panelists. Um, so now the National Advisory Board for Impact Investors put this event together and I think they're looking for insights and I'm sure even you know, our people who are watching us and also who are here are looking for insights on, on uh, what potentially uh, the NABII um, could do, right, um, to prioritize and what should they prioritize in order to attract both local and foreign investment into early stage social enterprises. So maybe Bita, if you don't mind, I can start with you. If it was if it was up to you, what should the NABII prioritize in the in the mandate to promote and grow impact investments in Zambia? 
I think the one thing that I would just say is that um, to work with governments to ensure that uh, the policies that are in place are, are very favorable uh, for both investors who are coming in and bringing in their capital to this ecosystem, and in this case, in the Zambian ecosystem, uh, and also to provide a favorable environment for working for, for, for startups in such a way that they don't have to be very much burdened um, and they're allowed you know, free space to operate and sort of regulation follows instead of you know, having a lot of regulations and impediments to the growth of some of these startups uh, that could choke off their growth. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, I'd like to start with you, Smunza. Um, same question. Oh, great. Um, I think that in addition to what Peter has said, I think uh, something that we could do, uh, we, we need to correct, in my opinion, is um, how we market ourselves as a country uh, and, 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 and in the sense of getting people to understand what's going on, getting people to understand what the opportunities are in the country and getting people to understand what's going actually going well in the country with regards to, yes, uh, this is where business is happening. This is the growth in certain sectors that is happening. This is where investment is happening. And these are the returns that are being realized on investment that's happening in there. Just make it, make it known that it's a viable place. Um, we talk about uh, going back to the earlier conversation around why people are raising certain places and they are successful and the importance of reputation to be able to do that. I've been able to get into meetings and strangers that I meet uh, outside the country, uh, you, you meet at a conference and, and they'll ask you about certain people and they'll say, oh, by the way, I know this is Zambian. Very good example. Somebody once came up to me and he said, hi, do you know Elias Tukimo? And being able to say, yes, I do know him. We're pretty close. We're working on this project together. Then they're able to say, oh, cool. But just by that, there was a level of trust then given to me based on the trust they had on Elias. So it then transferred to me and they were able to say, oh, if since you're working with Elias, uh, let's have a conversation about this. I want to do this with you guys because I believe Elias trusts you. So therefore we, we, we can then trust. Uh, yeah. So we need, to, we need to expose that. We need to expose that there is a reputation. There is proper business being done in this country. There is growth happening in this country. Yeah. And, and I don't know if it's our, and I've got nothing wrong with humility. I actually think it's a great value. Um, but, but we're just terrible marketers. And I think that that's something that we, that's something that we need to, to fix. Yeah. No, thanks. Thanks. So, um, Sam, what uh, should the NABI prioritize to promote, uh, um, investment, uh, in early stage? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I mean, great points by Bita and Simonza. And just to touch on what Bita said, um, I think for me, uh, two things is, um, uh, we, we need to deregulate uh, a lot of industries in Zambia. Uh, so much regulation. I mean, I looked at a um, small company. Um, um, I forget what sector they were in. It was just a picture on the wall. They had like 10, 12 certificates just to do one business. Um, I think we've got too much regulation. Um, uh, we've heard the new government talking about sort of a one license policy. I think that would be great. If we can just have one-stop shop, uh, whether you're in the healthcare sector, financial sector, one license sort of gets you access to begin to operate. Um, so that's one. Two is um, access to markets. So obviously investment is following a return and that return is, is coming from a market. Um, again, uh, just to pick on what um, I think the president the other day mentioned him going to DRC, uh, sort of creating a market and now you see all this interest about DRC because you, you sort of have a market, a potential market that's already been there, but you sort of are facilitating that, um, yeah, access to that market. So I think if we can have uh, uh, um, the, the Institute uh, sort of play a role in creating markets, finding access to markets, we know we are surrounded by eight uh, other countries. How do we tap into this 200 million plus um, our market? If, if, if that's something that um, uh, we can do, then I think um, it would be a much easier story so that look, here is Zambia, but aggregately you're looking at 200 million people as opposed to here is Zambia, 18 million people. Some very good points, Sam, and I think also some very good points. Um, I can imagine what, uh, Elias, you have to add. <laughs> Uh, three things. Sure. Um, the National Advisory Board for Impact Investment 
was set up to mobilize stakeholders and resources to facilitate uh, the growth of the impact um, investment ecosystem. And the, I think the first thing is to look at setting out a collaborative framework that involves both the public and the private sector. Um, part of the reason why ticket sizes are small is the market size here. The emphasis by the new administration in, in trade and will add value to the extent that it can on our primary products. Um, that then expands the opportunity and it allows for local enterprises to grow and to scale to a significant size. That will attract investment, but that requires collaboration across the full spectrum of activities that's necessary. And you've got to take a holistic view and you've got to be collaborative and it must be collaboration with all the stakeholders. So we almost need to set out a clear roadmap, clear objectives, milestones, stakeholder responsibility for each one and the timeline, but all of all the stakeholders. Secondly, I think it's so important to mainstream and localize the development of the kind of technologies that will make it far easier for small enterprises to access things like funding. Um, you now have software that records inventory uh, and can produce a profit and loss account or a balance sheet on a daily basis. That starts to get rid of some of the information asymmetries and the challenges around being able to pull the kind of data. And we heard that discussed uh, already on various panels. In fact, this morning, the governor of the central bank mentioned the fact that it's now possible to do remote audits of banks. And that's because you've got, you know, standard software now that will determine risk of almost anything. Um, and so we, we can leapfrog certain stages of development um, and bring that to bear uh, in the communities here for the benefit of small enterprises. And um, thirdly, I think it's so important to understand one key thing. People look at SMEs as, uh, I guess, small corporate enterprises or mini corporate enterprises. They're not. Just as a newborn is not a mini adult, it's a baby, it's a newborn. It can't be in the same environment, for example, in a hospital, it has to have different nutritional standards, otherwise it will die if you feed it on a diet that you would feed an adult. It's the same with SMEs. We've got to create the environment that can nurture their development and growth so that they're strong enough to be able to move into that stage where they can now be a mini corporate. And the Startup Act, I think is absolutely crucial setting up, I think, a, a venture fund that can have private sector management, but can be supported by government or government can leverage its convening power to be able to bring in resources to capitalize that and potentially even a startup fund. But we need to create that environment that will nurture these early stage enterprises. Otherwise, you wouldn't have a Victoria Falls. You only have it because you've got catchment areas thousands of kilometers away that are feeding springs, that are feeding tributaries, that are then feeding smaller rivers, that are feeding the mighty Zambezi, which then stretches 1,000, oh sorry, it's, it's 1.7 kilometers. It's the longest uh, water body uh, falling over a cliff uh, in the world, but it's only possible because those catchment areas are protected and we must do that for the SMEs. Thank you. That's very, very powerful. And I think uh, a nice, colorful way to conclude our discussion. Unfortunately, the time is up, um, but I think it's been an absolute pleasure for me. Uh, I would like to say thank you to our panelists. And if you will, to the audience, just kind of give them a round of applause. Thank you very much uh, for me as well. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to host this. I hope that this has been as insightful and as useful for you as it has been for me. Thank you very much.